Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back into the studio. At the moment of this recording I am not in the studio so I might sound a little bit different than you're used to. You might be able to hear some rain. So I apologize for that. Consider it atmosphere. It's almost like you're here with me. Anyway, we're here today to begin talking about mold making. More specifically the mold making process done to my latest sculpture, Empyrean. This video will be filled with technical info and a lot of technical jargon. And I'll include some links to some of the products I'm using in the description below. And if you have any questions regarding anything, leave them in the comments below. I read and answer all the comments. Mold making can be done a million different ways. Here in Italy, there's a certain way things tend to be done. And this might differ a lot from where you are in the world and where you make your molds. And so the materials might be a little bit hard to come by. So it's important to keep in mind that there are many ways to go about getting to where you want to go, which is creating a cast of the figure that you've sculpted. The process I'll be showing is fairly simple and very beginner friendly. It can be used on almost any object, any sculpture, though it does get complicated and time consuming when doing it to a large piece like this, and it does require quite a bit of thought and consideration. The silicone I'm using here is a putty silicone from Blue Star Silicones called Blue Sil RTV 3325P. I'll include the name in the description below and some links to some alternatives that are easier to come by. What's different about this silicone is that it is applied by hand, which is apparently quite unusual and somewhat of an Italian thing. Usually silicones are fluid liquids and they are brushed or pour over the surface of a piece. In this case, we apply the silicone by hand. Even here in Italy, people will often use a liquid silicone for the first layer because it captures details nicely and you don't have to touch your piece. When applying by hand, the potential for dinging your work is always there. But to me at least, a brush can ding your sculpture as well, or you can get brush strokes. And so I'm not really buying into that argument. The first layer applied on this sculpture, I think took me alone about eight to 10 hours to apply. And the subsequent second and third layer where I had help took about eight hours each. So it's a lot, a lot of work. The silicone is mixed by hand. It comes in a five kilo bucket with five tubes of catalyzer per bucket. So one tube of catalyzer per one kilo of silicone. Now the mix ratio is very forgiving, however, so I just mix by eye. I have enough practice to know what the color of the silicone should be once mixed properly. The yellow catalyzer that I'm using here sets up within a few hours, usually if catalyzed properly. There's also a pink fast setting catalyzer, which I'll talk about later in the video. I always apply from bottom up because the silicone needs to be dipped in water to stop it from sticking to my hands. And so if I go from the top to the bottom, water will run from my hands and the silicone down onto my clay surface and make it soft and, and wet, leaving it very vulnerable to being damaged. So applying from the bottom up ensures this doesn't happen. The first layer should be fairly thin to ensure no air or water is trapped, which would leave bubbles, imperfections, and it would leave a weak silicone, which will be prone to ripping. Usually I gauge the thickness visually. If the silicone is almost translucent, meaning I can see the color of my clay shining through it, it's probably thin enough. And doing it this way has yielded good results for me, so I think I'll keep doing it. As you can see, I keep a lot of the sculpture covered as I apply the silicone to keep it from drying out before I get to it. But I always unwrap areas a bit before I get to them so that they will dry out a bit, leaving them a little bit firm, which makes applying the silicone a little bit easier. There are many ways to apply the silicone. My preferred method is to kind of roll it into a ball, try to squeeze out all the air bubbles and get as much water out of it as possible, shake off the water and then apply. I overlap the previously applied silicone to ensure complete coverage. Then I always push the silicone out towards the edge, not back towards where I've already applied silicone. This ensures that bubbles of water or air are pushed out of the silicone. And as I said, the thickness is gauged by eye and a bit by feel, and I do my very best to keep it consistent. A quick word from our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online video learning platform where you can learn virtually anything, from baking to photography to painting. My viewers get a two month trial for free. So if you're interested in learning something new, click the Skillshare link in the description below and sign up. This I think is a good time to mention Patreon. If you are interested in learning sculpture from me personally and get feedback on your work either on email or via video chat, 
Patreon is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes. We can talk about armature, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out. There's a link in the description below. The second and third layer are a bit thicker, maybe half a centimeter each, and they are completely uneventful, so I'll spare you from having to watch me apply them. The only thing to note is that I tried to get a really even smooth surface, as the least amount of bumps in the silicone means better registration with my mother mold. The silicone shrinks a bit over time and the bumps in the silicone will obviously be on the inside of the mother mold, and once the silicone shrinks, the two don't match anymore. And that's a problem. So the smoothest surface possible on the silicone will yield the best and the longest lasting result. I also think it's very important to take pride in your work. You don't want to be embarrassed when you bring your mold to the foundry because the mold is so shitty. We are ready for building walls in silicone. You'll hear me use seam and silicone wall interchangeably while I'm doing this. That's because they're essentially the same thing. The silicone wall will be cut down the middle and the seam between the two halves of silicone will be running where the cut was made. So with three layers the sculpture looks something like this. And now the real engineering work begins, which is figuring out how the mold is going to open. This requires some careful consideration and thinking. Keep in mind that while you're watching this, some of it won't necessarily make sense until you see the model mold video, which will come out in a few weeks, so bear with me here. What's important to know is that I want the silicone parts to be split into two. The model mold can be several pieces for one half of silicone because they can be bolted together, but the silicone I really really want to split into two. So to make this happen properly, I need to choose areas where I'm going to have separate pieces. There's no way for me to make the entire sculpture into two pieces of silicone. It's too big for that and it would make it really difficult to cast in. And so I tried to break my mold down into several parts. Each part consisting of two pieces of silicone and however many pieces of mother mold it'll need to ensure that it can open. The first thing I do is split the upper from the lower half. And the split will be at the waist, corresponding with the poles going into the hips of the figure. Now this ensures that the poles won't get stuck in the mold, and the pieces will be more manageable to cast this way. The upper and lower halves can be attached once the pieces are cast. And it's fairly straightforward, I mark where I will build a silicone wall with a permanent marker. And so by the end, having marked the entire sculpture, I'll have a visual representation of how my mold is going to open, and I can inspect the entire mold before committing. The upper half will be the easiest, so we'll start there. The view you are watching right now will be the front half. I chose this and not 90 degrees to this view because this puts my seam in the least offensive place, on the sides of the figure, running up the flanks of the figure, and not right across the middle of the face. And this view also left me with the least amount of pieces to make for the mother mold in order for the mold to open. And I also want to find where the upper half is at its widest and that's from the direct front view. And finding the widest view and then splitting that in half tends to be the easiest way to make sure the mold will open. So even now I'm considering the entire thing. Not only the parts of the silicone that will come apart but also the how the mother mold will be constructed. So I'm considering the entire, how the entire thing will function once completed already. To mark the area where I will cut, I begin placing small pieces of clay. The pieces of clay are easier to see from this view because they stick out. Now the marker would be on the surface, so it'd be tough to see. With all the pieces of clay placed, I can step back and observe. And if I can see all the pieces of clay that I've placed at once, I know that I'm on the right track. If one piece disappears behind the horizon of my figure, then I need to move it forward so that it appears again. So this gives me a real good visual guide that I can observe from both the front and the back of my figure, and I can see if my walls are placed correctly. There's obviously a bit of playroom here, because if the wall is placed behind the horizon, all I need to do is to have a few more pieces of model mold on my front half. So this is something that I've considered already, of course. Once the pieces of clay have been placed, I can permanently mark the position of the seam with a marker. The arms will be separate pieces, so I mark where I'll cut them off. It's important that the line where the arms will be cut is straight. 
If not, then you'll have a lot of trouble cutting them off as saws tend to like making straight cuts and most saw blades don't bend very well. And here you can see how I'll separate the pieces. Upper body, lower body and the two arms. Now actually the hands will be made into separate pieces as well and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay, so the legs. The legs are tricky because the widest view is not really frontal. The legs are at their widest from this three-quarter view. So while the torso was at its widest directly from the front view, the legs are not and they will need to be split into two halves with each half facing towards the three-quarter view. From the front view, the left leg is behind the right leg, which is really problematic if I were to try and open it that way. Now doing it this way, the three-quarter view way, ensures the minimal amount of pieces for the mother mold, even though the mother mold will still need to be three or four pieces per side because it's quite a complex piece. This required a lot of looking and thinking actually. Making molds is kind of thinking backwards and upside down at the same time, which is very tricky on the brain, but you can do it once you practice it a little bit. You can probably also see now that because the legs will need to be cast with the two halves in a completely different direction from the upper half, it makes sense to separate the top and the bottom so you don't have a seam that twists around the entire figure. A seam that twists from top to bottom sometimes work, but I think in the case of a large piece like this, it would mean the mold probably wouldn't open properly, which of course is a problem. And if you cast it in one piece, it would be very heavy and hard to cast in. So splitting upper and lower half makes sense. The procedure for the leg is pretty much the same as the upper half. Mark with clay, which represents where the silicone wall will be, and then replace with permanent mark. Here is a quick view of how the walls will be built on the arm and the hand. The same thing applies here, because the hand is twisted compared to the arms, meaning the seam on the arm is 90 degrees to the seam on the hand, it makes sense to cast them in separate pieces. Any other way would mean compromising or making a lot more mother mold pieces. The seam on the arm is the way it is because this way it'll open with only two pieces of mother mold. If I turned it 90 degrees to match the hand, I would need four pieces of mother mold just for the arm and even more for the hand. Okay, here is the pieces all marked and we are ready for building walls in silicone. Building walls is very time consuming and I like to speed up the curing time of the silicone by using a fast catalyzer. The pink catalyzer sets up faster and means I don't have to wait for hours while the silicone sets up. Large masses of silicone or thick pieces of silicone will also tend to droop and sag under their own weight, which further prolongs the setting time because the silicone is moving, meaning that it tends to set up slower. So fast catalyzer saves me from dealing with all of that. I can apply a bit more than if I used only yellow, I don't have to wait between the layers as long, and I don't have to watch the silicone and fix it and ensure it doesn't droop or sag on me. The only problem is that faster catalyzers tend to be a bit more brittle, which could potentially decrease the life of, of your mold, so you have to be aware of that. A quick word from our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online video learning platform where you can learn virtually anything from baking to photography to painting. My viewers get a two month trial for free. So if you're interested in learning something new, click the Skillshare link in the description below and sign up. To hopefully minimize the brittleness and to make a pretty looking mold that I can be proud of, I go over the entire wall with the regular yellow catalyzer. Because it sets slower, it's a lot easier to make the walls pretty with a yellow catalyzer. And because most of the mass is already there, I only apply a thin layer and I don't have to worry about sagging while the silicone sets up. Nice square 90 degree walls are better for proper registration with the model mold. No holes or bumps means the silicone is a solid piece and a solid piece is less prone to ripping and tearing. And because I'll use a mold cutter knife with a bend in it to cut the seams, which gives me nice registration when I put the pieces back together, 
I'll need a little extra thickness to make it easier to cut. A knife with a bend obviously need a bit more width than a knife with a straight bend. The silicone work on this piece took me about 4 days total. That sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but it does leave me with a very nice mold that will hopefully last for a long time. And I won't have to be embarrassed when taking the mold to the foundry. This mold should be on par with a foundry grade mold. And I like to take pride in everything I do and do my very best. Or at least I aspire to be that way. And I think I, I managed to accomplish that goal with the silicone work on this mold. If you enjoyed the video and want to learn sculpture from me, check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, the link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share with your friends and family. It really helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.